how to use risk based cyber security techniques for attack prevention well that's the topic of our next industry session it will be presented by ram vaidyanathan cyber security specialist at manage engine welcome ram Hi everyone, hope you're all doing well and you're all enjoying the 8th Innovative CIO Awards and Symposium. Thank you so much for being here for my talk. Now, as you can see on this slide, the title of my talk is How to Use Risk-Based Cybersecurity Techniques for Attack Prevention. The keyword that I would like to highlight here, or the key phrase rather, is risk-based. So, if we think about it, what is risk? It is a propensity or chance of some threat happening to our most sensitive data. Therefore, the goal would be to ideally address this risk before it escalates into an actual attack. Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, it's also vital that we detect threats continuously, but that has to be fortified with a risk-based approach to attack detection. Great. So with that background out of the way, let me quickly introduce myself. My name is Ram Vaidyanathan, and I'm a cybersecurity technology specialist at Manage Engine, which is a division of Zoho Corporation. My role requires me to be updated about the latest methods attackers are using to take down organizations and steal their sensitive data. At the same time, I also look at the best ways for organizations to defend themselves from these attackers. My work helps our company Manage Engine in a in a small way, maybe, to build a unified and comprehensive SIM solution called Log360 that can set risk policies and investigate, detect, and respond to threats. Over the last one year, I have been traveling to many places and meeting a lot of security practitioners and CISOs like yourselves, and I've been learning quite a lot myself. So that's a little bit about me. Now let's go into the present state of cybersecurity in India. So this is what the statistics say. Uh, these are right in front of you. There was a 51% increase in ransomware attacks between Jan and June of last year. And this is actually not surprising because many CISOs and CIOs that I've spoken to say that ransomware is the most dangerous threat that they are facing today. Ransomware is also evolving into something more sinister called disruptionware. Now, the difference between ransomware and disruptionware is the fact that in disruptionware, the attackers are actually going after the operational technology or the OT side of things, the OT side of the organization. So here we're talking about things like building automation systems or even the security, the, the physical security systems, for example, the IP CCTV cameras, things that can actually you know, uh, bring an organization to a standstill. You can also add industrial control systems or ICS to the mix here. The other thing when it comes to ransomware, it's also moving to uh, the cloud environment apart from the on-premise environments at a very, very fast pace. Ransomware scripts are available in the dark web for even novice attackers to get their hands on, and they can do this very, very easily. Ransomware is also getting into a different model now. It's called ransomware as a service. And again, this is very easily available in the dark web. Now, these two other stats that you see here in the slide, they talk about the spike in cyber, uh, in cyber attacks and the great volume of the cyber attacks. And this proves the seriousness of the situation here in India. But, but the moot point is, why is this happening? And why is this happening now? And why is this happening at such a fast pace? Well, because the way that we have worked has changed. Firstly, employees work from anywhere. So it's truly a hybrid work world. Secondly, there is the ever increasing use of third party SaaS applications. A very interesting stat, uh, you know, apart from the stats that you see here on the slide, is that every employee nowadays uses at least 20 different uh, applications to get their jobs done. And thirdly, uh, and this is again, something very critical, organizations themselves have largely moved or migrated to the hybrid uh, cloud environment. Because of all of this, uh, there are new attack vulnerabilities. Attackers are performing identity-based attacks instead of going after the network. The data is simply not cushioned by a firewall or IDS and IPS systems or a VPN anymore. 
In fact, many people say that VPN is not the go-to security solution uh, anymore. So the simple fact is data exists everywhere and it can be accessed from anywhere. And because of precisely this, it is necessary for organizations to continuously monitor the risk posed by different entities, uh, different identities, and these could be users, devices, endpoints, anything on the network on a continuous and dynamic basis. So what could happen is attackers try and get their initial access. They can perform identity-based attacks such as man in the middle, brute force, or phishing. Now, these attacks are not anything new, but they still work for attackers trying to compromise identities. Now, take a look at this slide here. It's an example of a brute force attack. And this is what happened in 2022, just last year. So an eight character long password takes about 39 minutes to be compromised by an attacker in 2022. So the recommendation to decrease your risk exposure, make sure that you have at least 12 character long passwords. But even better than that would be if you make use of pass phrases instead of passwords. Research tells us that pass phrases are harder to compromise for attackers. And there is also less password fatigue for the users. So your users will also, you know, in a way, even if at the first instance, they are put off by long pass phrases, they will thank you for it in the long, in the long run. It leads to less password fatigue. But going deeper than this, going deeper than just using pass phrases, uh, you have to ensure that multi-factor authentication is in place. And when I say MFA, I truly mean MFA and not two-factor authentication. TFA is not really MFA. Two-factor authentication is not MFA. And along with MFA, you also need SSO or single sign-on working in tandem. Now, SSO brings all the cloud accounts and on-premise accounts under a single umbrella and enables you to perform uh, analytics on the usage behavior of the accounts. This is critical for a risk-based security me methodology. And this is the crux of the zero trust architecture. Now, don't get me wrong, Zero Trust is not just MFA and SSO, it's a whole lot of other things, but MFA and SSO are critical elements of the Zero Trust architecture. Now you can see that there are other things as well, right? So you have to get the visibility into all account activities through your SIM solution. And it would be really, really great if your IAM and your SIM solution connects to services such as Have I Been Pawned, to make sure that your users are not using already compromised passwords, right? And then of course, going back to my earlier point about MFA, it's gotta be three things. It's gotta be something that the user knows or the password, the traditional username and password pair that we are all used to. Then something that the user owns. So that would be their mobile phone, an authenticator app in their mobile phone to be precise. Always use an authenticator app instead of SMS-based OTPs. And then something that the user is. Now here we're talking about biometrics like fingerprints. So these are things that are essential for Zero Trust. Now Zero Trust, like I said, is more than MFA and SSO. And this slide here is exactly what it is. It's a mindset of considering all types of risk as you build your security strategy. Now we spoke about identities and computing their risk, right? So that's what you see here. But then even for your devices, and when I say devices for your unmanaged devices or also for your managed devices, uh, you've got to first get the inventory of all the devices and there's got to be a way for you to register them. Then you need to assess the device risk and compliance state of the device at all times. In case the risk goes beyond a certain threshold that is defined by you, depending upon the, the situation in your organization, you then need to take some action. Perhaps you need to take the device off of the network or you need to re-authenticate the device. Now, these are decisions that you need to take. These are policy decisions that you need to make. Um, so you've, the point is you've got to look at your devices at all times and compute their compliance state and the risk state at all times. Then uh, the risk posed to data should be looked at very closely as well. You need to classify the data and you need to label the data. And then you need to prioritize the data as well. Also, data should be encrypted at rest and while in motion. So many a time, 
a lot of organizations go about encrypting the data while in motion, but kind of leave it off while, when it comes to encrypting the data at rest, but both are important uh, for the zero trust ar uh, architecture and when you want to decrease the risk in the organization. And then it comes to the network side to reduce your risk, you've got to adopt micro segmentation. Now, micro segmentation kind of goes against, I would say, the principle of identity security that we have been talking about. However, the reality of the situation is it may take organizations some time to fully adopt and adapt to an identity security approach. So micro segmentation is still required in this day and age. This is where you make sure that there is no undue traffic between departments, functions, geographies, or other logical segments to decrease your risk. And in case there is a legitimate reason for traffic to flow between these micro segments, well, it has to be controlled and regulated. I'll give you an example. Let's say that there is a hospital environment and the surgeon working in the oncology department needs to access the records of a patient from some other department, maybe the pediatrics department. Now, the, this access, well, it has to be controlled and it has to be regulated. First of all, there has to be an approval process in place for the sharing of the data. And this approval process should consider what exactly can be shared and what cannot be shared. Maybe you know, you don't want to be sharing all the data between the two departments. Maybe part of the data can be shared and that has to be set at the approval process stage itself. This approval process should also consider the time for sharing the data. So once the time period uh, elapses, the access permission should be revoked automatically. And there's got to be a process to do that. So you don't have to manually go in and, you know, revoke the access permissions because then the risk of, privilege creep becomes very, very high. So all of this should be automated. Now, what I've talked to you just now is nothing but just-in-time access or JIT and just enough access called GIA. So these are both uh, critical aspects of the zero trust architecture and for you to reduce risk in the organization. Now, when it comes to looking at risk itself, it has to, look at, it has to be looked at rather both statically and dynamically. Now, you can't ever have a situation where there is zero risk in the, in, the, in the environment, right? You can't ever have a situation like that because at the end of the day, people still need to get their jobs done. It's a highly collaborative world. You still have to have some level of trust uh, there. So you can't really decrease risk. It can't be zero. It still has to be a positive number. So every employee carries some inherent risk or static risk determined by things like whether they are working from home or from the office, whether they are an individual contributor or they are part of a team. Uh, risk is also determined by the department uh, they are a part of, their access privileges. Again, that is the most important thing and so on. So to define what constitute risk uh, from these different factors, you can work with your HR team and lines of business managers. And then, you know, arrive at what really defines risk for you because every organization is unique. Now, when you look at risk in a dynamic way, you have to look at creating a baseline of acceptable behavior for every user and entity in the network. Then you look for signs of insider threats, data exfiltration, account compromise, and logon anomalies using user and entity behavior analytics or UEBA. These can be determined if you look closely for time count and pattern anomalies. The good thing is you don't have to write rules when it comes to UEBA. You know, it is powered by machine learning and artificial intelligence. So uh, a solution that does UEBA for you learns by itself by looking at past behavior and it learns with experience. Now, a time anomaly happens when an activity gets performed at a time that it is not expected to be performed. A count anomaly is when an aggregate number of events in a specific time period exceeds what is expected. For example, there are 100 accesses of a critical file server between 10 and 11 a.m. when only 20 accesses were expected. Now that's a count anomaly. A pattern anomaly happens when there is a strange sequence of events never seen before or rarely seen before. And if you want to look at risk holistically, you've got to look at all these factors. 
Anomaly detection can also be enhanced with the use of peer group analysis, which is what you have on this slide here. So here's where you put users, for example, in a similar cluster and not just consider the user's own past behavior to determine the risk, but also the past behavior of the cluster that the user belongs to. This will lead to better risk scoring. For example, all the users belonging to the marketing department or the sales department can be put into one cluster and the activities performed by a person belonging to the marketing department can be compared to the average behavior of the cluster, of the marketing cluster, to determine the risk score. So this will lead to better risk scoring. Another way in which you can uh, better compute the risk is through seasonality. Now, in India, many banks work, or I think all the banks work on the first and third Saturdays and do not work on the second and the fourth Saturdays, right? So an activity that is normal in the first and third Saturdays is not really normal in the third and fourth Saturdays because the organization is actually off on those days. So this is what seasonality is. Apart from just merely looking at the user's past behavior, it will have a time sense built into it. And it will take that into account when computing the risk. So all of these things, your security analytics platform or your SIM solution powered by UEBA should be able to do to compute risk. Now, when it comes to uh, you know, uh, performing a comprehensive data risk assessment, a few things are, again, very, very necessary. Again, this is the fundamental thing to do. Look at the formula at the bottom of the screen here. Risk equals vulnerability times threats times business impact. And risk has to be considered for every data asset that the organization owns. And then the risk of that data asset, in case it, it were to be breached, it has to be calculated. Now you have to look at the potential vulnerabilities. You have to look at the threats the organization is, expect, uh, is exposed to, and also the business impact in case of a breach. Now the three put together will give you a measure of the risk. Now, then what you can do is you can come up with a priority. What is the risk that you need to, uh, that you need to protect against first? So usually the data asset with the highest risk will need to be prioritized first, but then that's a subjective call for the CI, for the CISO as well. So that's a call that you need to make. But usually uh, the data asset with the highest risk will also be the highest priority because the business impact is a part of this formula here. And then uh, you can take both a quantitative as well as a qualitative approach. When it comes to a qualitative approach, you can assign values of high, medium, or low to the, to, to, to the risk. And then uh, when it comes to the quantitative approach, you can actually give a, a, a value, a number value, to look at it more in a more objective sort of a way. But whatever the thing is, whatever uh, way you follow, ultimately you've got to identify your security gaps and then you have to look at, okay, this is the gap I have. This is the solution that I need to deploy in order to plug that particular gap. Again, extremely critical when you want to take a risk-based approach. So here are some best practices to reduce risk. Now I spoke about a lot of this already, but I want to mention one thing that is not there on this slide and that is the people aspect of things. So user training is extremely important when, it want, when you want to reduce the risk your organization is exposed to. I can't stress this enough. People can be your weakest link, but they can be your strongest link as well. So please make sure that you do that. Also look at doing micro, micro training instead of just having a, a, an awareness training once a, once a year. This was probably the norm two years back. But now with the whole risk equation changing, anytime a user performs any risky activity, maybe have a video play for them or maybe have a pop-up and tell them exactly where they went wrong and what was that risky activity they performed. This is called micro-training and we as a company, Zoho Corp, is also looking at doing these things in our own company so I can speak with some sort of experience here. So look at micro-training to reduce your risk apart from what you see in the slide here. Great. So yeah, that pretty much brings me to the end of my talk. Here's an ebook. Uh, it's called Getting the Best Out of Your Sim Deployment. And it's a handbook for all security analysts and professionals in the security function. So I would highly recommend that you give this a read whenever conveniences permit.
You can just search for getting the best out of your SEM. And I would also like to point you out to Manage Agent Expert Talks, where we write articles on what is going on trending in the cybersecurity space at the moment. And as cybersecurity practitioners, you can also contribute to Manage Agent Expert Talks through a guest blog. And we also have a cost savings calculator from implementing a SIM solution here. So I would highly recommend that you give this a read whenever you can. Also, just Google Manage Engine Expert Talks and you should land on the page. So with that, I thank you. Uh, Manage Engine is a division of Zoho Corporation. We are made in India, but we are made for the world. Thank you so much for listening. To thank you. Have a great day. Thank you, Ram, for that great presentation on a very contextual topic.